I think I'm gonna move to the next one and then you can ask question. At least I can start it. Again, our problem is classifying nodes, documents in a citation network. And then your labels are available for a small portion of your data. You have undirected graph. These are your nodes. You have some edges. And then you can introduce the adjacency matrix. If one uh, node is adjacent to another one, you're gonna read off the weight on that edge connecting those two nodes, and then you're gonna put it in this matrix. And then you can create a degree matrix for A. And then you can introduce the unnormalized graph Laplacian. So this is gonna be clear as soon as I give you an example. This is the example. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. So the size of your adjacency matrix is gonna be six by six. One is connected to two. So you're gonna put a one here. One is connected to five. You're gonna put a one here. These are unweighted. If they were weighted, you would put the corresponding weight here. And then the degree matrix, you just add up the rows, the entries of each row. So this is gonna give you a two here. This is gonna give you a three here, a two here, etc. And then the graph Laplacian is this matrix minus this matrix. It's gonna give you two, three, negative one, negative one, etc. Why do you call it graph Laplacian? So I want you guys to click on this link and uh, look at the interpretation of the graph Laplacian as a discrete Laplacian operator or discrete Laplace operator. And the intuition is if there is heat structure on the graph, what is the heat? You can associate heat for each one of these nodes. And as soon as you have heat, sometimes the heat cannot transfer from one to six, but it can transfer from one to five. And that's why you're calling this graph Laplacian. And that's the interpretation. There is heat associated to each vertex. So I think I'm gonna stop here, let you guys ask questions, and then we can continue the rest next session. So is this sort of saying that, that heat, since there's like a negative one at this uh, um, zero one location in the delta matrix, that like heat is like moving away from node one towards node two? Actually for that one, you need to look at the equation. So I want you to click on that. It's a little bit subtle. So you cannot look at this and interpret this. Okay. But uh, the idea is that if there is heat, let's call the heat phi one, and there is heat at this other node, phi five, the heat is gonna get transferred from node one to node five, according to the uh, difference between the two. So it's gonna be phi five minus phi one. Mm -hmm. Okay, or it's gonna be phi two minus phi one. There is not mm -hmm. gonna be any heat transfer from one to six because there yeah. is no edge between them. Okay. As soon as you write down your math a little bit, I don't know, six lines of simple math, you're gonna see that the Laplacian is gonna show up. Okay. Basically this matrix is gonna show up, D minus A, in a Laplace equation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just read this, it's not difficult. And it's gonna take okay. you exactly to the location that you need. I was also wondering if I could ask a question um, from the, the line paper. Sure, I so wasn't what's the question? Yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, so when we're talking about the second order proximity um, and we talk about the context of other vertices, so is, is UI bar the context of vertice VI? And that's just like the average of the encodings for its neighbors? Uh, so I don't want you to interpret the bar here as an average. So don't do that. Okay. What I want you to do is each vertex is gonna have two roles. You either condition on it. So when you are conditioning on it, it's mm. gonna have the role of itself. So you're gonna put UI here. But if you are actually writing the probability on a vertex conditioned on something else, then VJ is gonna act as the context of VI. Mm. And because it's as the context of VI, you have a different vector corresponding to that. So, so you can think of it these... this way, VJ can have two identities. Mm -hmm. One is as a context of VI, for instance, as the brother of VI, mm -hmm. or as, uh, I don't know, Jackson himself. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. So um, I wanted to ask uh, how I use the embeddings in a like downstream task. So like 
in language, there's a natural sequence and I learn my embeddings for a single language and then I get, you know, a new sentence coming in and I can just feed this into, uh, you know, recurrent neural network or like a transformer. I guess like in graphs, there's no natural sequence for me to like feed it in. And then on top of that, every time I get a new graph, I'm going to relearn the embeddings. So I'll have a new set of embeddings for every single graph I see. So I was kind of wondering like how you use this in down the embeddings you learn in downstream tasks. So that's a very good question. And that depends on the task that you want to do. Okay. For instance, node classification. For a task like node classification, your data are your nodes. Okay. And then you have label for some of your nodes. For instance, there is a label for this particular node or another label for this guy, but you have no label for the other data in your data set. So you can go ahead and classify this node. And what is your training data? It's just your embeddings for these data that you have for those nodes. These are the input, the output are gonna be the corresponding labels. And then you train a simple classifier, maybe logistic regression on that. Once but you I, have your model, you can apply that to other nodes. So um, I guess I'm just thinking if I had, you know, uh, perhaps a new graph um, and I can't say how many uh, nodes are going to be labeled ahead of time. So I can't, you know, fix that. So I maybe I'll have like a recurrent neural network that will be reading in the embeddings of the nodes that are labeled. Um, do I just pick a random order to to pass the nodes and the embeddings of the nodes into the network to classify the other nodes? So I think there is a little bit of confusion here. Uh, and the confusion is what is your data? And that's perfectly fine. Your data could be multiple graphs and then you are classifying your graphs. For instance, you have graph one, graph two, graph three, graph four, graph five, and then these are your data. or your data could be the nodes in a single graph. For instance, the nodes on Facebook, the users of Facebook, or the users of YouTube, Okay. The videos so, on your YouTube. So but in you those types of tasks, I don't need to worry about generalizing to new graphs. All I'm doing is learning embeddings for this particular graph, and I learn a classification task for the embeddings of that particular graph. Exactly, yes. For instance, you have your network, it's uh, LinkedIn, uh, you have your graph, you know who is connected to who, you know your graph structure, but then you want to know, should I advertise this particular product to this particular user or no? Okay. Okay, that's a classification. Yes or no, you classify. And then if it's yes, you show that the ad, show that person the ad. So I guess the task that I have in mind is a little strange. I'm thinking of classifying a graph. So someone gives me a graph and I tell you what type of graph that is. Yeah, and I was thinking one, how to use the embeddings to produce that label because now I need to generalize across graphs and I'm producing a completely different embedding for every single graph I see. That should be fine. That one we are going to cover. So don't worry about it. Okay, we'll get there. All yeah. right. So if your task is graph, uh, if your data are graphs, graph one, graph two, graph three, we are going to see an example. But for now, if you want to actually do that task, it is also possible from what we have done so far. You need a representation per each graph, okay? If you have this graph here and you have a vector for each one of your nodes, a simple idea is just to add all of them up. They have the same dimension, just add them up. That's gonna give you a single graph, single vector for your entire graph. So you can think of it as global pooling. It's gonna okay. be a single vector for your entire graph and then you're gonna, this is your data now. Okay, and just because like, I'll be using the same process to learn the embeddings every time, the hope is that when I see a new graph, learn the embeddings for that particular graph and then some of the embeddings, I'll have something that my classifier can still recognize. Yes. So, okay. So yes, with graph, we have to be careful with what is our data. The, so your data could be these nodes, the red guys, or it could be the entire graph, which is your data. And we have methodology for both of them. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, sure.